I'm Natalie Vinay. Today we're going to talk about gynecologic cytopathology, epithelial cell abnormalities, glandular. I will cover all of the entities listed here. And it's important to note that my source material, my reference for these criteria is the Bethesda System for Reporting Cervical Cytology, the 2015 edition. And the aim of the Bethesda System is to have terminology that is clinically relevant, reasonably reproducible and flexible, and reflects the most current understanding of cervical neoplasia. Cervical cytology is primarily a screening test of squamous intraepithelial lesions and squamous cell carcinoma. Detection of glandular lesions is hampered by sampling and interpretation errors. So on the left, we have a squamous cell carcinoma with a markedly abnormal shaped um, cell with keratinizing features, and on the right, a case which we'll cover later um, of adenocarcinoma in situ. Adenocarcinoma in situ is considered the counterpart to high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, or HCIL, as the precursor to invasive adenocarcinoma of the cervix. So on the left, we have a case of um, HCIL, and on the right, a case of adenocarcinoma in situ. This case also had associated invasive adenocarcinoma. The proportion of adenocarcinomas associated with HPV-18 is higher than for squamous cell carcinomas. So um, still, um, and this you know goes back and forth between different studies, but it is important to note that 16 and 18 are the most common um, HPV subtypes for adenocarcinoma and adenocarcinoma in situ of the uterine cervix, and that HPV-18 um, does tend to have a higher proportion of cases of adenocarcinoma than squamous cell carcinoma. Sorry. Adenocarcinoma of the uterine cervix overall is less common than squamous cell carcinoma across all age groups. So you can see the squamous cell carcinomas are those black bars um, ranging from patients in this study 20 to 85 plus. And you can see those gray, the gray, light gray bar is adenocarcinoma. And then adenosquamous carcinoma, um, always less common across all age groups than the squamous cell carcinoma. The relative incidence of adenocarcinoma has increased in the United States, at least, due to relative decreases in squamous cell carcinoma due to successful screening with cervical cytology. So you can see here the squamous line has those squares and the um, on the top, and you can see um, broken down by uh, racial groups is decreasing across time. However, the adenocarcinoma rates um, on the bottom graph uh, do not seem to be doing the same thing. This chart also highlights another fact about cervical cancer in the United States, which is dis disproportionate incidence rates of cervical cancer and death from cancer in black, Hispanic, and native populations. So now we will move on to um, the criteria, the categories, um, for Bethesda terminology and glandular lesions of the cervix. So um, these are the listed categories by the Bethesda. Uh, AGUS, or AGUS, or atypical glandular cells of uncertain significance, is not used anymore. It was an older um, group to avoid confusion with the similarly sounding squamous lesion. And when possible, atypical glandular cells should be categorized as to the site of origin as management is different. However, if it's not possible, then the term atypical glandular cells, or AGC, can be used. So first we'll cover normal endocervical cells. It's always good in cytology to establish a background. So normal endocervical cells have variably sized nuclei with an average of 50 micrometers, which is, are the yellow circles which are slightly larger than that of an intermediate squamous cell at 35 micrometers, which is the red circle. Cells exhibit polarity with nuclei placed at one end and mucinous cytoplasm at the other. And in this profile, they exhibit what is called a picket fence morphology. In separate profiles, the endocervical glands, when cut in, in a different plane of section, demonstrate honeycombed appearance. Um, which is noted here. 
Nuclei show finely granular and evenly distributed chromatin with small nucleoli. This is an example of tubal metaplasia, which can appear crowded and somewhat atypical. Recognition of the cilia assists in um, correct identification. Now we'll discuss normal endometrial cells. Normal endometrial cells are smaller than endocervical cells with nuclei about the same size as an intermediate squamous cell. The nuclear chromatin can be dense, heterogeneous, and does not contain prominent nucleoli, and overall these cells have scant cytoplasm. Intracytoplasmic neutrophils are characteristic. And classically, endometrial cells shed in these tight clusters, which are called exodus. So now we'll move on to atypical glandular cells in general. So the Bethesda terminology really is broken down into these three groups. So endocervical cells, um, atypical glandular cells, endocervical, endometrial, or in general glandular. And that NOS or specifying comments, um, we'll get to what that means in just a moment. So the atypical endocervical cells um, we'll cover first. So the cells occur in sheets and strips with some cell crowding nuclear overlap and or pseudostratification. Cytoplasm is still abundant, but the NC ratios are increased. You can have nuclear hyperchromasia, mild chromatin irregularity, still with distinct cell borders, and in liquid-based preparations, groups are more rounded, as here, and more three-dimensional. You can have variation in nuclear size and shape, nuclear enlargement up to three to five times the size of a normal endocervical nucleus, occasional nucleoli, and rare mitotic figures. So now we'll cover atypical endometrial cells. Distinction of cytologically benign from atypical endometrial cells is based primarily on cell size. Atypical endometrial cells are not designated as favor neoplastic. They are typically present in small groups as pictured here. These cells show some hyperchromasia and slightly enlarged nuclei with relatively scant cytoplasm and ill-defined cell borders. Cytoplasm can be vacuolated. Atypical endometrial cells can be associated with a variety of intrauterine processes, including polyps, endometritis, hyperplasia, and carcinoma. This category is used when it is not possible to give an origin, and origin should be indicated whenever possible for atypical glandular cells, NOS. Cells here are in sheets and strips with some crowding and overlap. Nuclear enlargement is three to five times a normal endocervical cell. Mild nuclear hyperchromasia, mild chromatin irregularity, rare mitotic figures. Nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios are increased, but still there's relatively abundant cytoplasm. So to get to atypical endocervical cells favor neoplastic, um, cell morphology, either in terms of number or characteristic, falls short of a definitive diagnosis of adenocarcinoma in situ. So this uh, category shows abnormal cells in sheets and strips. Atypical features include nuclear overlap, or as noted here, pseudostratification. Chromatin is coarse. A suggestion of feathering can be noted, and cell borders can be hard to discern. So now we'll cover endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ, or AIS. Cells can be present in sheets, clusters, and can have pseudostratification as noted here. Feathering is typical. Nuclei are enlarged and chromatin is coarse. The nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio is elevated. Usually there's a clean background. And this diagnosis should be made with caution if not all the above features or most of the above features are present. This patient had abundant groups present on the slide and coexisting high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, which is another common occurrence. Follow-up on this patient showed adenocarcinoma in situ. 
Some cases have multiple small nuclei and ill-defined cell borders. Nuclei are enlarged and overlapping. Follow-up on this patient also showed adenocarcinoma in situ. So now we'll discuss adenocarcinoma endocervical. In this group, abundant and normal cells typically are present with columnar configuration. Liquid-based preparations show more three-dimensional clusters. A suggestion of clinging diathesis is noted here at the edges of the cell group, although this is less prominent in liquid preparations. In poorly differentiated cases, disorganization is more marked with cellular pleomorphism, nuclear overlap, increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios, and clinging diathesis. Apoptosis and mitotic figures are easily noted. This slide shows the differential diagnosis for hyperchromatic groups on PAP test specimens. This was part of an original presentation at the ISGIP Journal Club in November of 2020, if you'd like to go back and watch it. Um, this slide is courtesy of Dr. McMurdy, who made the presentation. Um, these different th groups, this is, of course, not every um, cause of a hyperchromatic crowded group, but it's um, a lot of the more common ones, including atrophy, benign endometrial cells, tubal metaplastic cells, which we've already covered, high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, and then this category of H-cell EGI, which is... Um, endocervical gland involvement of high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, which is important to mention in the differential diagnosis of adenocarcinoma and adenocarcinoma in situ of the uterine cervix, as we know from histologic evaluation, that these processes frequently involve endocervical glands and can mimic glandular morphology um, with that clustered morphology. Um, and they can show you know, similar features, high NC ratios, hyperchromatic nuclei with um, coarse nuclear chromatin, and then also the endometrial and endocervical adenocarcinomas um, should be at least considered. And this is a chart um, which I made as I was preparing this lecture with some of what I thought were differentiating features or helpful um, when thinking about different levels of diagnostic certainty towards adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma in situ, and then the two preceding that, including atypical endocervical cells and atypical endocervical cells favor neoplastic. Um, these charts help me when I'm studying these kinds of things. If you find this helpful, um, you can certainly take a screenshot and um, or maybe come back to it. I won't read it to you. Okay. And now uh, we'll cover adenocarcinoma of endometrial type. So this is a case which was confirmed as endometrioid adenocarcinoma on biopsy. Note the tightly clustered atypical glandular cells with focal cytoplasmic vacuoles. This case was also endometrioid adenocarcinoma on biopsy. Uh, it was a FIGO grade 2 tumor. You can see that increased nuclear atypia here, and certainly those macronuclei are concerning. This was a case of uterine serous carcinoma, um, which also shows increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios. And they're a little bit hard to see on this um, projection, but under the microscope, they did have macronucleoli. So when you see macronucleoli, uterine serous carcinoma should cross your mind. It's often not possible to have that level of certainty, obviously, on a cervical cytology specimen. I'm just letting you know what the follow-up was. This is another case, which was uterine serous carcinoma on biopsy, again, with those macronucleoli. You can see it has, um, this case has a clean background and those smooth luminal borders. And then also, although it's very uncommon, one must consider extra uterine adenocarcinomas in cervical cytology specimens. This is an example of a high-grade serous carcinoma of the fallopian tube slash ovary. Um, you can see those um, rounded glandular cells, focally vacuolated or, um, you know, sort of foamy cytoplasm. There's a mitotic figure or um, I, I, it looks like a mitotic figure towards the bottom of the screen. In extra uterine cases, there's typically a clean background. This case, of course, has a little bit of um, grunge at the bottom of the screen, but um, this is an example of drop metastatic disease. So these papillary clusters 
were noted, um, presumably, that came through the fallopian tube into the uterus and then were sampled as a part of cervical cytology. So that's all for the GYN cytopathology glandular lecture. I will post this um, video with some resources linked below and including four more journal clubs where we presented about um, topics which may be of interest to you. So um, please don't hesitate to provide feedback to me in the survey below and uh, reach out to me if you need anything or have any um, comments. Thank you so much.